guys, welcome back to another episode of Strip by Sia, your podcast for strippers, sex workers, and all the fancy naked people in between. We have a very exciting ex- um, guest joining us today for this episode, and I am currently gushing over. <laughs> I'm super excited. I get to mix my love for food and sex work on this episode today. <laughs> yes! Because <laughs> we are bringing, oh, we are, I am bringing Nikisa Newton on the show today from Meals Free Heels, all the way based in Portland, Oregon, the USA. And we're going to be talking about sex work. We're going to be talking about community, Portland, food, all these fun things. So I am excited to bring Nikisa on the show today. Nikisa, are you there? I am here. I'm live and direct with you, Steph. How are you? I am also good. Oh, yeah. I forgot to introduce myself, but yes, Steph is my name. Steph Sia or Sia, if you want to call me that. Okay. My, my former exotic dance name was Kimchi back on the <laughs> stage. <laughs> food related and like you know maybe drag queen inspired like a little bit of everything but I'm your host every week here and uh, it's new episodes every Sunday and I talk to you about different aspects of the sex work industry that's what the show's all about so this week as I mentioned we have Nikisa Newton on the show today Nikisa say hello once again Hello, Nikisa Newton here, chef and owner of Meals for Heels. My pronouns are she, her, chef, and queen. Chef and queen, I love that. <laughs> Perfect. I can't and wait to get into all this. Mine, she, her, please. She, her. Thanks for asking. Uh, that's You're definitely welcome. one area I personally need to work on as well. So thank you for bringing that up and letting me know what your preferred pronouns are. Definitely room for improvement for me. <laughs> Yeah, hey, we're all learning. Believe me, we're all learning. So, um, yeah, no problem. Absolutely. So, okay. So, I want to tell the audience about you, your business, who you are, and what you do, and all this fantastic initiatives that you are doing down in Portland. So, I'll I will tell the audience a little bit what I briefly know about you because I heard about you and your amazing business. On one of my favorite podcasts, Race a Sandwich, which is now yeah. gone, cry, <laughs> a tear. Yeah. I'm really sad yeah, about that. It was that. Uh, originally based in Portland, Oregon yes. as well. Yes, it was. And there were so many layers to that podcast in terms of food, story, community, history, colonialism, mm-hmm. everything. There's so many layers that I just found myself like addicted to. And yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was just incredible. And I heard your story. I remember seeing that on the show, and I was like, what? What is happening here? Like, Kale and Quinoa Bowls for the sex worker community. I think that's, like, I think that's what the title was of the episode or something along those lines. And I was like, this is perking my interest. This is different. And basically what I know that you do is that you were a late night meal delivery service out in Portland, Oregon, catering to the sex worker community there, sex positive community. You're also a black owned business as well. You're a person of color. You also identify as, as queer. There's so many things here that I want to unpack on this episode. I'm also formerly incarcerated and a college what? dropout. What? <laughs> but I also come from a two parent family or two parent home. So who, who knows? Oh my gosh. What? There's so much more. Okay. <laughs> oh my God. Where do we start? Like, okay. Was that I definition okay for beach. you? <laughs> uh, no. Okay. Go for it. No, you go for it now because I feel like that's what I kind of know from the minor stalking that I've done on you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> How would you describe what you do in your own words and on your your own terms? In my own words, my own terms, I would say, um, I like to say that I put together two things I enjoy in life. Sex workers and yes. food. Yes. Or community and food. Um, yeah, uh, I just, I mean, it's just trying to put a, I, I don't want to say positive life, but it's putting, bringing a light to the sex worker industry. Mm-hmm. It's something that's been around forever. There should be no shame. There should be no shaming on women since it is a predominantly uh, female, you know, uh, business industry. Yes. Um, it's, to me, it, it's supply and demand. Um, it's, I, I get it's the patriarchy. I get it's all those things, oppression, racism, all that stuff, but uh, it's a bunch of bullshit. 
you know, I mean, <laughs> I mean, Portland, Oregon, where there's 75 plus strip clubs yes. here. And, you know, it just made sense to do this. You know what I mean? Uh, Portland's also known for their food scene, their late yes. night food scene, their cart food scene. Yes. And they're also known, like I said, the strip the strip capital of the United States. Um, or, I mean, I guess them, Portland or Atlanta, you know, people, <laughs> people tend to argue about it, but <laughs> apparently per capita, Oregon has most strip clubs per capita, but yes. with that many strip clubs and being here for, I've been in Portland for over 10 years and I've had friends who work, you know, I mean, all aspects of sex work and cool. friends who work in all aspects of the clubs. And it just, you know, like I said, it's just like putting two, two, two and two together. It was, um, something that was needed. Yes. And it was, you know, it was like a void and I, I filled that void and it was the best decision I made in my life. And I'm, yeah, I'm incredibly happy from the feedback and the turnout and um, I'm blessed and grateful every day. Oh my gosh. I am so inspired, also so jealous, but also so happy <laughs> that you're doing something that's so amazing because you're basically fulfilling my dream of sex work and food. <laughs> like, oh, yeah, 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 definitely. That's incredible. And hey, this could expand elsewhere, you know what I mean? Because their sex workers are everywhere, correct? This is very true. And you guys all know that this is a worldwide podcast. Absolutely. So, I mean, the majority is in North America and Canada and the USA, but. It can go places. <laughs> Absolutely. As long as you got internet, all that stuff. Exactly. And we're going to get cool. into all that pretty soon, too. So I want to talk to you about Portland. You mentioned you have spent a good amount of your life in Portland. Yes. Um, like 10, 12, 13, 13 years. Good amount of time. Where are you originally from? Oh, I'm a California queen. I was born in California, okay. Travis Air Force Base. Yes. Um, I'm a military or Air Force dependent, not a military or Air Force brat. Um, <laughs> my dad my dad served 20 years. We lived in Japan, Portugal, Arizona, North Carolina, uh, California, North Dakota. Whoa. And I personally have lived Portland and North Carolina. Add that to the list. Incredible. Oh, my gosh. Yes. What? You have such a great history. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I, I mean, I, I'm grateful of being an adult and being older now and seeing how much that has shaped and evolved me as a person and obviously how it comes out in my food. So um, mm-hmm. if I could, you know, tell that to my dad right now, I obviously would. And I do tell my mom when I do talk to her. Uh, yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. How did you find yourself in Portland? Was it because uh, you had relocated there because of your parents, or was that some place that you wanted to go to, or how did that? How did you find yourself here? How did I find myself in Portland? Um, I was actually in North Dakota at the time. I was just getting in trouble, <laughs> and a bunch of friends, uh, literally at one time, it was like nine people almost at the same time moved out to Portland and then sporadically other friends moved out here. So I was working with FedEx at the time there. They were able to transfer me over to, uh, Portland's FedEx. And, uh, yeah, I just had to get out. It was just time to go. I got too comfortable in the small Uh town and, you know, just not being my best self. So, um, Mm. this, this was a a big change and, um, I'm I'm absolutely glad I did it. And I drove my car all the way out and, um, yeah, that's, that's the story. That's how it started. Very cool. Was that when you were incarcerated? Um, no, that was, um, that was actually why I had to stay in North Dakota. But, oh. <laughs> uh, no, no, uh, no, no, I was, I think I was just off of probation by then, but still just not, just not being, you know what I mean? Just, mm. just being wily, just be comfortable. <laughs> Your friends, the same thing, go out of the bar. There's nothing wrong with that, but I just no. wasn't being productive. And so, yeah, no. Um, actually, when I got to Portland, something from North Dakota came out there with me. So I literally had to deal with law enforcement. Oh. All this bullshit when I got to uh, Portland, Portland, which scared the shit out of me and uh, was really um, kind of like a those pivotal moments where it's like, all right, I'm trying to do right now. I'm not trying to hustle and do all this bullshit. And yet I just moved halfway across the United States <laughs> and my past caught up with me. Right. But luckily, everything worked out because I'm not a kingpin. I'm not, I'm not, you know, <laughs> so, um, and I had a really good uh, federal public defender lawyer, and I'm, I still talk to her now, and she does amazing things. Awesome. And, um, yeah, it was it was definitely that slap to the face of wake up like you need to do right. Like they don't fuck around here. For you know sure. I mean? So, yeah. So Portland's now home, and you've been there for, you said, 13 years now. Mm-hmm. How yep. is the move from North Dakota over to Portland? Because I – Correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like Portland and, I mean, probably better now, 
But Portland and North North Dakota, they're both very white. Absolutely. They're both very white. Um, let's see. I mean, the Midwest, uh, or I should say North Dakota. You know what, I, what I like to say is that, I'm, you know, the time I spent there, it helped shape who I am now. Mm-hmm. Would I go back there? Absolutely not. Have I only been back, I think, twice, maybe three times since I left? Yep. And, um, I mean, like I said, it shaped who I, who, who I am today. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of, I guess, a little angst or whatever I have about that, about North Dakota, just yeah. because I, I came from Japan to yeah. North Dakota, and I had people, white people, staring at me, yeah, or saying things like, "Oh, I've never had a black friend, or I've never had a black person in my house." When I'm like, I was in Japan, you know, what I, mean? yeah. I, was, I was over here in Portugal, and and especially military kids, it's definitely a plethora, a rainbow of different cultures and races. So, for sure, um, it was the first couple of years of marriage, just being angry, why people are staring at me, and very defensive, and then and then mm-hmm. you go into just kind of like trying to fit in, and then you go into this other wave and all this stuff. But yeah, I, I, they're definitely both white. They're both definitely different spectrums, for sure. Um, for sure. But um, there's there's definitely some freedom, I'd say, coming out to uh, Portland. Just the, the West Coast vibe is. Um, it's chilly, Willie. It's, it's, uh, it's in my, I like to say it's in my soul, it's in my veins, especially that I was born in California. So Yes, back to the, the West, West Coast. Coast. the best place. Agreed, 100%. Always. <laughs> I'm with you Always. on that one. Always. Yeah. Was it really hard growing up as a military kid and just moving around constantly? And, I mean, going from, like, Europe and Asia and then coming back to the USA, I feel like it's, like, almost downgrading. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's it, yeah, and it's all hindsight. You know what I mean? Because uh, mm-hmm. I remember being in Japan because we we're there for like five years, and like, oh, oh. we're bored. And like, oh, I want to go. You know, we just want to go to another base or something like that. And then wow. you know, the next base was North Dakota. I remember going to the library at school and checking out a little book on North Dakota and saw <laughs> bison. And I just, I just, I, I was excited. But then when I got there, I was just like, this is not anything <laughs> like what Japan or the base or the setup anything was like. So, no. um. I, you know, I honestly, I don't, I don't, um, I don't feel it was difficult. I think one of the things uh, I, I did uh, kind of like reminisce on or dwell on was uh, having a best friend. Um, mm. Because we moved around, you know, you don't get, you, you do build relationships and friendships, you know what I mean? Yeah. And really good ones. But, <clears throat> you know, you know, I just remember like, especially in North Dakota when it's like high school, it's like, oh, you know, I've known this person for this many years. And we used to, you know, sixth grade and fifth grade and this, and I know their cousin and their aunt or, yeah. or their family too. Not having my family close or... Um, not having that best that person I've known for seven years or five years, you know what I mean. So it took time for that, and um, also the fa- on the opposite side. When I was in North Dakota, there's a lot of people that are like, oh, I don't talk to my cousin, I can't go there. My uncle works there, shit like mm. that. Where I'm like, I, I don't get to see my family other than like reunions, and so I, yeah. I couldn't imagine being in a place where I don't talk to my cousin who's in the same town as me or my uncle. You know what I mean? So um, yeah, it's just you know two different sides of the coin. But, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah that must I be- loved it. It was great though. to be immersed in a foreign country uh, as a kid. I wish I could have been a teenager in Japan <laughs> or Portugal. But yeah. um, either way, like I said, it just made me who I am today. For sure. And then, of course, I mean, Portland is an amazing city. I love Portland. And, of course, we were supposed to interview in person when I was supposed to take my trip out there in April. Oh, but yeah, right, 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 yeah, right, right, yeah. yeah. And I was like, oh, my yeah. God, I got to contact her again. Like, okay, no, no, this is – we got to do this virtually. <laughs> I still want to connect. So I was like, okay. But, yeah, so, I mean, I go to Portland at least a couple times a year um, okay. just because – one, it's a food destination, and it's a six-hour drive from Vancouver, and obviously the strip clubs are just, like, the best <laughs> compared Which to here in Canada. To? I've only been to the one that's right downtown. It's kind of touristy. Oh, my God. It's right downtown, uh, like, right by, Voodoo, oh. right by Voodoo Kick-Kat Donuts. Kick Club. Club. Yeah, that one. Right. Yes. Yeah, good spot. Yeah, it's fun. It's, it's always bumping when I'm there. So yeah, no, it's a good, good club. Uh, if, like, I definitely a lot of customers who or clientele, I should say, that uh, worked at that club. Fun. It's great, and the energy is awesome. That I think that was the first time I actually saw it rain on stage. Oh, oh really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, you know, it's a kick club. I think one of the things about that spot in particular, I feel like it's it's a lot more per, like performance. Like mm-hmm. each dancer is almost a different character, and they might even have different I don't know, personas or personas. characters while they're on stage. For sure. And absolutely, it's always packed in there. It's a bigger club. Like even just the way the seats, the booths are, etc. Um, yeah, it's a it's a definitely 
a favorite spot of mine. It's a good time. It's, it's a really great time. And we were uh, supposed to go to, you mentioned the other club, that Rouge one, that's also close by downtown. We were supposed to go there too, but then we just, it just, it just didn't happen. It just didn't happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely, I get it. No, I get it. Um, yeah, the, I mean, club, that's like almost, not polar opposite, but just, it's it's a huge club, I'd say, mm-hmm. too, at that. There's probably, I feel like a minimum of 15 and 20 women, like, working on a weekend night, if not more, wow. at the champagne room or VIP rooms. There's, like, three or four stages. It's just a whole different world. But uh, that's that, that was a spot I frequented as well, um, and I enjoyed Club Rouge as well. <laughs> so, obviously, Portland uh-huh. is Strip City. Mm-hmm. Food cart heaven. Food truck heaven. Yep. Nope. <laughs> It's pretty much a dream city. <laughs> it, it can be. It can be. Yeah. And the, was it the Mount Hood or the mountains are just, what, like 45 minutes away. The coast is an hour, 20 minutes away. Yes. Um, et cetera. That's, that's definitely one of the big beauties about it is being able to go to all those different um, environments in just a short amount of time. Hot, skip and jump. Yeah. It's lovely. And then wine country is just there too. Like Washington is close by as well. Again, it's all relative, and it's just a great vibe overall, I would say. Mm-hmm. And um, I want to know, I want to... how did you, you... – like, what, what is your story in terms of starting Meals for Heals? How did you marry the two concepts of, of caring to sex workers and your, I guess, your background as a chef? Um, so, basically, when I came up with the idea of Meals for Heals – Actually, I should say it was collective. It was me and a former partner of mine. Mm -hmm. Um, She was in school full time. She was also interning and she was also dancing. And uh, often she would have to choose between either making a meal before work, doing her homework, taking a nap or getting ready for work. And Uh. she, between the two of us, I would would definitely say I was the better cook. So (laughs) I either make her a meal and we have a meal before she went to work or sometimes I bring a meal to her club or she'd take a meal with her. And so um, when I delivered one time, she just got a huge feedback from her coworkers. They're just asking, what are you eating? What is that? What is that? What are you eating? It smells so good. And so she just literally, uh, I, you know, she just made the comment, the words, you know, they would pay you for that. And I was yeah. like, what? And she's like, yeah, if you brought, you just, you know, you delivered healthy, delicious food to the club, you know what I mean? They would absolutely pay you for that. For you sure. know, she just told me how uh, often sometimes uh, some, you know, some dancers have told me how they, you know, choose between like having another drink. Or you know, like the hunger, but the hung, you know, they're hungry, but it's just tater tot steak, yep. chicken nuggets. I mean, it's a, it's the menu obviously is catered to the clientele, which is obviously ninety eight percent men, and um, <laughs> that just uh, and I'm sure just like also I should say too, me being a chef, I've worked you know I've worked in several kitchens, restaurants. Though you get I get sick of the same food at my restaurant. I can make mm-hmm. me being the back in the kitchen. I can make whatever the fuck I want. You know what I mean? Yeah. But I still you know you tend to get sick of the you know the same menu, same shit. So even <laughs> even if they they did have healthier options i'm sure they would kind of you know be over it so sure. um it was it was just uh going on that idea and just just doing the math like i said there's 75 clubs um the ex at the time told me one night 23 dancers showed up on a saturday they had someone had to go home because they were on a schedule Whoa. you do the math it's like i don't know 1500 x amount of dancers and that's just dance clubs you yeah know what I mean? there's you know sex workers that do full service there's there's uh, amateur porn. There's um, you know, dominate all the all the avenues. There's you know so what I mean? Much. All the swingers clubs, etc. You know what I mean? So um, it just it just made sense to me. Like I said, to think that after nine ten p.m. you can only get um, I, I mean it's pretty much the, the unhealthy food. Yeah. You know what I mean? Delivered to you. And I think a big factor is not just being a female, but you know, having the respect for a sex worker where you don't want to have a random grub hub or caviar or whatever yeah. delivery service come to your club and then, I don't know, maybe catch feelings or come by again or ask you for your number or something yeah. like that when you're just trying to eat. You're at work, you know what I mean? So yeah. um, there's there's uh, there's that aspect as it uh, with it as well. So um, when I made the menu, I definitely – you know, kept in mind that this is an emotionally demanding and a physically demanding job. So that's why I was keeping yes. it healthy, vegan, vegetarian, mm-hmm. and very light, but hella full of flavors. Yes. And I'm so glad you mentioned the health aspect of it because obviously I've worked in clubs too and there's nothing open or it's just very limited 24-hour options. Mm-hmm. So it's just like pub food, fries, pizza, like deep fried everything or just like 
just awful food, donairs, which is probably on the healthier side. And I say that in quotations. You can't see me right now, but that's in quotations. It's not really healthy. (laughs) But it's really limiting and also, like, I don't want to be eating crap all the time. And that example you said, when it's um, they have an option between a drink or some food, I'd probably just go for the drink. Right, right, right. You know, and I, I get that. I absolutely get that. I understand that. And, and you know, you know um, also eating in front of customers, etc. all the things. So, I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of people who order and they just eat it when they get home or save it for later or nibble on it during the whole shift. Mm-hmm. Um, but at least I, I, several times over, I've been told that they're like the, the clientele are extremely happy to not, you know, have that greasy rot gut in the morning, <laughs> the next day feel so sluggish. You know yeah. what I mean? And they're, they're starving. It's a physically demanding, emotionally demanding job. Yes. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know what I mean? So um, the least, that's the last thing the uh, sex workers should have to worry about. Absolutely. So tell us a little bit what's on the menu because I'm dying to know. I mean, I've peeked already at the menu, but tell the audience what you have in the menu because it all sounds fantastic. <laughs> it is fantastic. So, um, <laughs> I have uh, the I like to cha cha, and that one is uh, say southwestern theme meal. It's uh, a green rice, so it's brown rice that I cook in a green salsa that I make, yeah. and then um, all I should say all my meals start with a base of massage kale, so it's salt, pepper, lemon yeah. juice, olive oil, and I massage it to make it less bitter, to make it easier to uh, digest, etc. Right. Um, so with the with the cha cha, uh, it's the green brown rice. It's a citrus slaw, which I use uh, kiwi fruit some other citruses, uh, honey, um, and I blend that up. And then uh, I mix that in with some cabbage and carrots. Yeah. And then um, house-made red salsa. Uh, and then black olives, Tillamook cheddar cheese, crushed one of chips, which is a favorite tortilla chip here in the Northwest. Good. And then I... Yeah, I call it avo smash, which is just avo, salt, pepper, and a little bit of olive oil, and a little bit of lime juice. Yeah. And let me see. Yeah, just cilantro. I top that with cilantro. And yeah, I believe that's it. And then <laughs> um, I have the, the G- GTP, which is the, I say the number one banger. That's definitely the crowd favorite. Okay. And the GTP is called Getting That Paper. Yes. And, yeah. <laughs> uh, that's Tom Carlos Cauliflower. Um, so basically, this one, I was starting with the idea of a vegan marb. Okay. And then it morphed into something else but um it's uh <laughs> cauliflower i roast i roast and then i rub it in a tom ka paste to that i mess with yes and then uh, um i do sweet potato noodles because those are gluten-free oh my and, god um what was it? they're gluten-free and they're i don't know they're kind of like a nice springy spun spongy kind of noodle okay glass type noodle yeah um and was it oh brain fart sorry um <laughs> okay. so with that, i'm sorry togarashi togarashi and truffle oil tomatoes oh and I, then i do a pickled asian cucumber and then oh i do thai basil cilantro and mint a little bit of toasted coconut and a little bit of furikake fish is that meal yeah um, it's, it's a little bit of sour meets meets the bold flavor of tom ka yeah, it's, um, it's, it's amazing. I, I, can't even <laughs> I, I can't even believe I made it. Seriously, it was, <laughs> the funniest thing too, it was just like I was I was at home cooking, and I turned around and looked in the cabinet, and I saw truffle, and I saw this, and and I just put the two together, and, and it's it like a little works. bit Japanese, it's a little bit of Thai, it's a little bit of Vietnamese, all these little things Yum. mixed into one healthy, delicious, bold. awesome vegan meal. Oh um, my god! Also, I <laughs> but there's menu, more. But really small. I only have a four item menu because it is just me. But um, okay. I also have the um, oh uh, uh, the verbal tipper. Okay. Which, which I was I try to name I try to give them names I have to do maybe with sex work or oh clubs that's or great late it's night, so late cheesy. Night <laughs> So, and, and I'm sure you know, and I hope your viewers or listeners know what a verbal tipper is, that someone who maybe is at the rack and they say, oh, you're gorgeous, or how's your night, you're great, all this stuff, but they don't put down a dollar at oh, all at the yeah. rack. Oh, yeah, very Delicious. familiar. So a verbal tipper. We don't, we don't like that shit. We don't no, like we don't. Tippers. <laughs> but this, this verbal tipper is, once again, the base of massage kale. It's a lemon pepper couscous. It's jarred and nair, which is uh, nair, an Italian okay. pickled vegetable medley that's a little bit it has a little spice on it but okay. it's nice crisp vegetables it's a good way to get your veggies if you're if you're low if your income's a little tight if you're oh. on a budget you can definitely get your veggies that way um and then with that it's going to be marinated artichokes uh some Ooh. cucumbers that i season tomatoes that i season with paprika and a little bit of cumin and then i do a little bit of cotilla cheese Yum. a balsamic drizzle and i think oh i do a uh, 
toasted uh, quinoa to give a little crunch to it as well. Oh my god! And then, and then last is the other. I say the number two maybe banger is um, the freaking vegan, which is my ode to Portland, and that's <laughs> uh, once again the massage kale, okay. the green brown rice again, yeah. and then I made I roast sweet potatoes, apples, and plantains in a, kind of like a pumpkin spice and a little bit of citrus spices. And then I saute uh, mushrooms in a savory mix, like garlic, rosemary, chili flake, and then toasted coconut, and then um, this amazing sauce called Salsa Lozano. It comes from Costa Rica. When I was traveling down there, it's on every table. It's just pureed vegetables and seasonings, but it's phenomenal. It's a head turner. When I have people try it by itself, (laughs) the look they give, the head turn they give is, is everything, and it's worth it. And so I drizzle that on there, and then I make a sweet salty and spicy nut mix with uh, walnuts and almonds oh my god um, yeah because like uh, and you know a lot of vegan food and sometimes vegetarian food can be mushy the textures are the same so right. i try to keep that in mind by ha- adding crunch in different ways whether it's a nut or toasted quinoa or toasted coconut oh my gosh this all sounds freaking so good right now i haven't had dinner yet so like Mm, (laughs) oh man i can't wait to eat this i wish i had some in in front of me i will feed you when you get here so there we go when the world opens up again i will definitely like connect with you on that that sounds incredible and this is all something that you thought of yourself Absolutely. Oh my yeah, gosh. absolutely. I make everything from, I mean, scratch. Other than like the jar in here, there's very limited items that come out of a bottle or can and whatnot. But yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, I don't know, it's kind of like something I would want to eat a little bit late totally. night. I like kale. You know, I can use other greens as well, but, um, you know, I, I use a brown basmati rice, you know, just healthier. Nice. Um, well, it's just, it's just, I'm not super experienced with vegan food. But mm-hmm. I like that I'm keeping it vegetables and not using whey proteins yeah. and TPV and um, soy curls, etc. So, totally. Um, just keeping it like, as well. Yeah, it's just like nice whole food, and I also meant I also recognize that you're using a lot of local um, ingredients and produce there too, which is mm-hmm. even better. Again, going yeah. to support the Portland economy yeah. over there. Right, and right. Supporting small yeah, business, we have access so. to it. It's uh, that's it's such a beautiful thing, and it's just it's just building community. You know what I mean? Like meeting your mm-hmm. farmers, meeting the growers, meeting small farmers, meeting small growers, it's, uh, other vendors, people who make the jardiniers or make the sauces in town and whatnot. So, for yeah, sure, it's, it's it's a beautiful thing. It's incredible, and like I just love this initiative, and I love what you're doing for the community. And for the sex workers that are out there, I mean, how is the climate right now with the clubs and everything in Portland? Are they operating during COVID or have they shut down? Because here in Vancouver, they've mostly shut down or they've had to like limit no dancers. There's no lap dances happening. Wow. So it's like we're fucked right now. So. <laughs> Uh, Hence, former well, dancer. Yeah, I mean, so Portland's, I shouldn't say we, because I, I, I don't dance. I'm not a sex worker. Mm-hmm. I don't want to take that from, from y'all or them. Yeah. Um, so I would say I believe it's about 95, 92% of the clubs, I believe, are closed. Oh. Um, I Yeah, business, as far as delivering to clubs, has, like, stopped pretty much. There, okay. there was, I was steady. I was a little bit steady. Um, probably the beginning of summer, but yeah. you know, everything was just touch and go. You know what I mean? Like Kit Kat Club, Mary, certain clubs. Some days it was actually busy. Mm-hmm. Some days it wasn't. Some days I probably don't want to walk into a small busy club. Yeah. Some days I do. Um, you know, it was it was a weird thing because I obviously I want to. I mean, people have to make their income. Yes. But I just want you know everybody healthy and safe and, safe, and whatnot. Yeah. Um, but I mean, everybody that pretty much I I guess uh, follow on Instagram, everything's been. They've been safe. They still, some of them who can work at clubs, still work at clubs. Other people have gone and done other things or mm-hmm. they've gone online with it or they just picked up another trade or some other interest they're in. Yeah. Um, that's the best thing about, I'd say, sex workers. They're very resilient. Yes. And hardcore crew. Even, <laughs> if, even if the fucking red face, orange face bastard wants to not give them a stimulus check for prurient acts or behavior, shit like that. Right. It's fucked up. But they're, they're going to keep on, keep it on. And like I said, supply and demand. Yeah. If people want to bust the nut, you know, you know get, get their jollies on, then, you know, they wouldn't, you know, be there. But, you know, sex work will be here forever and always. So, of course. And they, they'll just keep, they'll figure it out. You know what I mean? I know it's a, it's a big um, slam to, you know, who they are and what they do. Mm-hmm. But, um, 
uh, I look forward to when the clubs open back up. I miss those relationships and yeah. um, the atmosphere, um, all that, all that. Oh gosh, I'm. It feels like ages ago that like I danced in a club, yeah. you know, like, and I've had I've been forced to pivot as well. So I've been yeah. working a civilian job, and that's been interesting <laughs> and fun. But like the the difference in money has been huge. And, you know, I've been forced to make, like, a lifestyle change, which uh, along uh, along with, like, a lot of my peers, too, like, hasn't been easy or, like, have had to change the, the business model pretty much to moving everything online. But then that's been also really tricky, too, because everyone else is doing that. So right, right. It's, yeah. It's been hard. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I understand. I absolutely agree. I understand. Yeah, and uh, we will get this together. We will, we this will. <laughs> and uh, yeah, yeah, I just, um, yeah, I just look forward to going back to what I what I do, the main my main niche. Totally, yeah, absolutely, for oh. sure. And like, I also wanted to ask you too, like, for the business and in, in terms of marketing, I know it was a lot of word of mouth from the beginning. Absolutely. How yeah. do you? How do you get the word out to customers or potential customers? How do you market the business? Is it all just through Instagram or? Well, Steph, um, <laughs> honestly, before I started, I actually did my own little research. Okay. I went to clubs. Uh, I talked to, I remember one particular club, I talked to a bartender for a while, just regular conversation. And then like 45 minutes in, <laughs> I finally had you know enough in me to be like, all right, so it's someone about your food it just you know this that what's up with their kitchen i don't see anybody in there but it's open <laughs> etc so um and this particular club has a there's a taco truck right next to the, like in the club or in the oh. club park lot, basically yeah but same thing, you're gonna get you're gonna get sick of eating the same thing so um oh, or, or they're saying customers will bring them food or their friends will bring them in food right so th- that was just like another you know obviously aha moment like all right this <laughs> definitely could absolutely work and that was just like one club so i did uh yeah definitely talked went to clubs because like I said I had friends that worked in clubs where they bartend or they mm-hmm. danced or they did security or etc um so I just kind of went around did my own little research, research and uh and then just took the necessary steps you know uh, I went to NISO it's an acronym for the micro enterprise services of Oregon oh. and they help people who want to start a business or have a business um they're located just now, they're located just three blocks from my house. Oh, cool! But I haven't been in there since uh, since I moved over to this area, uh. unfortunately. But <laughs> they they work with everybody, but they definitely focus on BIPOC businesses. Yes. And I feel personally that office, Nita, and all the people that are in the office, it's uh, it feels like home. It's it's um, it's a, it's I feel like one of the most culturally diverse, generate cross generational. All the things, uh, <laughs> offices in the state of Oregon. You got oh, young, old, black, amazing. white, gay, brown, everything. And um, it's I miss them too. I, oh. I miss being there. But um, I still work with them. It's just you know zooms. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, they, I, I, I'm very uh, grateful for them as well because when I walked into to Miso and said my business name and mm-hmm. and what I was about, I never got any weird looks or like you need to change your name or what anything. They just they're just like yes, <laughs> like, yes, that's a great idea. So that's yeah. wonderful. It's so good that they were just supportive about it. And again, there's no like weird like head turns there or mm-hmm. like oh wait, what do you mean meals over heels? What do you mean by that? Like. Right, right. <laughs> And how did you come up with the name? I mean, it's pretty obvious, but it's got such a good ring to it, too. <laughs> yeah, you know what? Um, I Honestly, I think I just wanted something that comes off the tongue and obviously rhymes. Yeah. Uh, originally, it was Meals for Six Inch Heels. Um, right. But Amiso suggested. It took a while, but they suggested, you know, maybe just do a Meals for Heels. And so um, I, I went with that. And, um, yeah, that's – I'm not quite exactly sure other than <laughs> I just wanted it to rhyme. I think I was even going to do – was it like Savage Gardens or something exotic nights or late night, late night, was it late night satisfaction or late night something? It was something, I had crazy names, but uh, this one just hit me. And most of my life when ideas or labels or nicknames, shit like that is always just, it just randomly hits me at the most strangest time. So yeah. I'm glad that one. Yeah. And it's just, it. then once you get it, it's just like a light bulb went off in your head. And you're like, oh, it's got to be this. <laughs> yeah. 
Absolutely. That's always fun. <laughs> and ironically, if you if you look at your keyboard, if you, uh, listeners, the four, the meals, I use the number four. Okay. And I, I, that's, sometimes I make a typo, and it's a dollar sign, which goes hand in hand. Hey. So oh, yeah. I just looked at my keyboard. Uh-huh. <laughs> I was like, yeah. You got, you got it. There we go. <laughs> it's about making that dollar, but respecting the work that goes in that dollar. And that's what I love about the sex worker community. Yes. They understand what, not just the dollar, but their time is money. This and yes. this, this and that. It's a job. This is me at my job. This is me not at my job. We're going to get two <laughs> different things. And um, it's just interesting the shit they go th- go through while they're at work. Because no other jobs yes. or industries usually get asked the ridic- ridiculous questions or get treated in a different manner. Oh, all um, the time. Yeah. All the time. And you said that better than I than I could have said it. So you, you just summarize it right there in a nutshell. <laughs> but right, right. I, I also want to talk to you, too, about um, pivoting and resiliency as well. So I also read about your business in terms of, obviously, you said most of the clubs have, unfortunately, closed down due to COVID. But with that, your, your business is also now catering to frontline workers, the protesters there as well in Portland because there's lots of huge protests. Um, is that still going? Is that still going on? Yeah, that's still going on now. Yeah, it's still going on. Does it sound like a war zone sometimes? Yeah. Oh my god. I don't, I don't venture downtown at night or anything like that. I, I yeah. stay away. Or if they go into, it's not just downtown. Sometimes they go in neighborhoods and march and shit gets hectic. But oh my god. Um, I mean. I'm with them. I just can't be out there. That's all. I'm yeah. sorry, but I just, I just personally can't put myself out there. But I no. support them in every shape and form. It's potentially dangerous too, because like we, um, I also invite another friend of mine who is a, or sorry, was a dancer in Portland too. I think she used to dance. I forgot which one it was. It wasn't one the clubs downtown. Actually, I'm not going to name the club <laughs> because like okay. I don't have her permission to say that. But um, yeah. yeah, she she was like, oh yeah, the, like back when I interviewed her, and this was months ago. She was like, oh yeah, the protests are still going on, and that was to me ages. That was months ago, and now it's November when we're recording, and it's still happening, which is just boggling my mind. No, has nothing changed there? Um, no, no, nothing's really changed because uh, the cops aren't backing down and I think they're sending mm-hmm. in state troopers and um, people, I mean, if people aren't, yeah, you know I mean, people have time on their hands, some people do and so, yeah. you know what I mean, um, I mean, I get, you know, if this is truly what people, if I guess if the motive is correct, sometimes, you know, it's, is it just people who don't like cops or the system or do they mm-hmm. actually care about black lives and bi black lives and black right. women and black women's health, etc.? And are they actually implementing these things into their regular everyday lives? Not just, you know, fucking up windows or fucking up cops, which could be fun. And I'm grateful for that. But it's like, when it's over, are they actually doing the work? Yeah. And that's a really great question because I feel, you know, back in June, there was a lot of noise surrounding Black Lives Matter. And Mm -hmm. now I feel like, where did y'all go? (laughs) What happened? Yeah. <laughs> right? Like it's like crickets. Well, like I mean, it's it just explore. I mean, yeah, I it's it's interesting. I actually was very very grateful, and lucky enough to meet uh, one of the co-founders, the original co-founders, Alicia Garza, here in Portland. Oh wow! When she came oh, wow. to do a, to a speaking tour and whatnot, and it was actually like a really intimate small setting, and I got oh. hanging out with her afterwards, which was cool. cool. But um, yeah, it's it's weird. I always kind of like look online and be like, what does what does she say about all this, or what is what's mm-hmm. her thoughts? Because since it has blown up and grown, yeah. uh, so huge, obviously internationally, all that stuff like that. Um. It's, you know, it's weird to see a term or word now used so much that, you know, it loses its kind of significance. You know yeah. I mean? like, uh, and, also, you know, how some people are like, well, it's not just, you know, it, you know, it jokingly like, oh, just black people just matter. That's it. We just matter. That's it. You know oh what I mean? Gosh. Like, it's matter. That's all we get from <laughs> um, But I, I, I respect everything. The three founders who started Black Lives Matter, everybody else who's opened up chapters all around the world. Yeah. Um, I mean, the fight continues, so um, just, uh, I don't know, kick a cop in the balls for me, please. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> hey, they chose, they chose that work. Yeah. Just like a sex worker chooses, you know what I mean? Yeah. They chose that line of work. Exactly. That's what they, you know what I mean? We all have that agency, so, mm-hmm. exactly. <laughs> there's no such thing as a good cop. No. <laughs> okay. 
Oh. Oh, they fuck with sex workers. I'm sure you know that. Like, yep. Which is bullshit, too. They sure do. Absolutely. I feel like everything is so much more, um, uh, what's the word? Um, blown up. What's that word? Not blown up. I can't think of it right now, but. Magnified. Magnif- magnified, maybe? Yeah, maybe magnified in the States. But obviously, it's so much bigger down there, too. And I just feel, I just, I just, I just can't believe that all of this is happening this year. And you guys are our neighbors. <laughs> like, it yeah, seems. Well, let's tell it two different countries. Two um, different countries, but it's just like we're like, very we're similar in so many ways. Like, we're all part of North America. It's just like, how can things be so different? I don't think I don't think America thinks that, though. I think America thinks we're America, and that's all that matters. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, the world listens to follow us, and uh, yeah, so, yeah, I don't know what to say about that. I like Toronto. Toronto's a badass <laughs> city. Awesome. I've been to Winnipeg. Um, I would love to go to Vancouver. You must come to <laughs> Vancouver next time. We'll eat all the food up here. And you'll check out the strip clubs here. It's a little bit different than the States, but... <laughs> what's, what's different? What's so different? Oh, gosh. It's a different vibe for sure. Like, again, when I mentioned earlier in the the episode, like, going to Portland was the first time I saw, like, people making it rain in the club. Like, that does not happen here. It just does not happen. And it's just, I think maybe it's just maybe people are just polite or people are just broke or just stupid at sitting in the front row or just not knowing the rules or something. But it just seems a little bit more chill, maybe. And and it really just depends on which club you go to, too. Because there's right, right, different right. clubs, different vibes. Of course, same in, same in Portland as well. But it's yeah. just different. We don't have champagne rooms at all. Um, like, it's, it's just VIP. So, like, private dancing and, like, stage, mainly. Hmm. So, it's still a fun time. But it's just different. <laughs> Very yeah, different. Yeah, so definitely. But... Again, teach their own, I suppose. <laughs> this hey, it works for y'all. It works for y'all. It exactly. works for y'all. It works for us. It works for us. <laughs> <laughs> we all get paid in the end, so it's all good. Right? America. <laughs> it's like Canada on steroids. Yes. <laughs> and maybe nicer, but. <laughs> maybe nicer. And an attitude problem and something else. <laughs> they just need a hug. We just, the maker just needs a hug. Calm down. Bust a nut. There we go. Just get a hug. Yeah. <laughs> What's your next question? What you oh got yeah, I also want to talk to you. Yeah, I also want to talk to you about um, what I read about online too. Like you raise the funds for Black LGBTQ, um, those who identify as women, and other causes such as that. Can you tell us a little bit more about that, or at least elaborate a little bit on how you got involved oh, for those communities? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the first. You say raise funds for, and it, I catch. Oh yeah, so question. like you were. What, what I read is that Meals for Heals also raises funds for Black communities as well as the LGBTQ communities as well. So yeah, tell us a bit um, more about that. Obviously, you identify as Black. You identify as queer. So you're already in those communities, but tell us your about the involvement there. My involvement there is, um, I guess, definitely more so during COVID was um, looking to my community for support and my support and my community giving me support. Honestly, when I when I opened this business, I I thought I needed the ex partner of mine who was a white blonde female to even get into the clubs. You oh. know what I mean? Um, but I realized that uh, I would say I don't. I just find my own two feet, and I find more strength in uh, people that look that look like me. You know, like people have maybe gone through the same shit that I have, have gone through, whether mm-hmm. they're formerly incarcerated or they've been houseless or they're trans, etc. Right. Um, resilience, resilience groups, marginalized groups. Um, it's just I don't. I mean, it's I don't know. It's it's comforting to. Look to like I said, look to your own community for for, for sure. all types of support, and not just support, uh, just like everything. Just like if I'm shopping now, making more conscious decisions. When I buy plants, I go mm-hmm. to a pick owned or a buy owned business. Um, yeah. When I eat, same thing. When I shop, same thing. Um, and I've, I don't know, I, I was doing that a little bit before, but uh, definitely uh, with COVID and the lynching of Mr. Floyd, it's definitely yes. turned up for me. And, sure. I mean, it's just about keeping that money circulating within the community. I mean, how else do we, you know, keep 
like get out. Not I should say not build, but just uh, be able to be on our own two feet and do what we need to do without someone else trying to regulate and all this stuff. And also, it just opens up your perspective. You know, mm-hmm. you see a black yoga instructor, or you see a Latino this, or you have all these different aspects because you get such a monolith of a lot of cultures and races in America. Yeah. So. It's, it's nice to see you and work with black farmers and like indigenous farmers. And yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty dope. I, like I said, I found strength in my community. For sure. And I really just love that you're giving back to them. And, and it's, especially at a time right now, as you mentioned with COVID, uh, it's, it is the time to support your small businesses and support local, really. Because mm-hmm. a lot Absolutely. of those businesses are suffering. Right. You know, or right. at the risk of uh, shutting down. Yeah, shutting down. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's it's uh, it's it's interesting to see how many people have kind of risen up, uh, mm-hmm. you know, during all this. And I obviously I see on Instagram a lot more, you know, just people DIY. You know, whether it's tamales or homegirl is making mochi. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know what I mean, just other people stepping up, making, setting up plants and shit like that for BIPOC groups. Um, BIPOC people so it's it's been it's been interesting to see um I I uh I welcome it I'm yes. excited for the people to get their food or tell their story through food out there I, I just hope it continues you know during the you know this this winter I'm, I'm a little scared about what winter is going to bring you know what I mean but yeah. um, I keep it positive and we take it day by day for sure and I guess with day by day like what what are the next steps for you what are the next steps for me so right now um currently I'm just I'm just going to ease into the new year. There's some projects coming up. Ooh. Hopefully uh, some documentary film crews. Uh, with uh, Potential, Ooh. yeah. Black Palette is a is ran by a hunter who is a black trans fe- female. Or male? I'm sorry, black trans female. Who okay. does, I guess, uh, Black Palette is it's like food, it's sex, it's politics, it's race. It's all mixed into one. They hold events in New York City. That looked to be amazing and rad, and I really wish I could, uh, could have gone <laughs> to events out there. But yeah. um, we've we've talked and we've done interviews and stuff like that. So there's plans, there's talk of okay. potentially you know documenting Meals for Heels and you know telling the story of Meals for Heels. Um, cool. Currently, I will twice a month. I'll cook for the they call them the C3PO camps, okay. which are the house houseless camps that the city. Or the county, no, the city of Portland set up for houseless people during COVID. Oh, so wow. uh, they get three meals every day. It's, um, it's, I haven't been to the camps actually because, because you know, COVID, all that stuff like that. Someone, yeah. uh, snack block comes and picks up the meals for me, but I just started doing that. So I'll do wow. 88 meals next Saturday. I'll do 88 meals on the fourth Saturday. Wow. Um, before I was doing trans houseless PDX brunch with join PDX. But that's kind of moved over to the C-3PO camps. Okay. Otherwise that, I'm just, um, you know, maybe going to get some t-shirts, more merch out. Yeah. Um, just just work on a website, something basic like that. Just cool. enjoy this time to do research and development. Uh, maybe do some more butchy things like hang art. And <laughs> uh, get my hands dirty and, I don't know, uh, stuff like, yeah, stuff like that. There's, there's a lot about to pop off but um it's just different with the COVID you know I mean? yeah it's still, it's still so questionable but right now Meals Reels is absolutely going strong um yay I'm I'm inc- I, like I said once again I, I wish I had a, another word to say how blessed and grateful I am to be thriving during this time yes and, but on the other note of it is uh, I don't I don't I don't get to 100% enjoy all this because there's so much going on there's so much you know what I mean yeah the, the turmoil and all that stuff like that but you know, I'll have my day when that comes, but until then, we just just keep working, keep doing what I do. That's awesome, and the sex the sex worker community oh. is very thankful for you and your services. Same with the frontline community, oh. <laughs> and, and oh my gosh, every community basically, because you are dipping your toes in pretty much every community that needs it. That so. Needs it. So, so thank you for that. I have to say thank that. you. <laughs> I mean, it's like I'm either a part of these communities or. I can understand some of the struggle these communities go through. And um, I don't know, it's, it's been, I feel like I, I like to say that putting, it pays to put your community first. You yeah. know what I mean? I wasn't going for the dollar sign when I started this, you know what I mean? And from, from having a business like this, I've been able, like I said, to meet Elisa Garza, to cook for Apano, which is the Asian Pacific Alliance of Northern Oregon, cool. to cook for Pride Northwest, to cook for all these other groups, all these different cultural, racial all these other social justice groups here yeah. in Portland, and I never thought 
this originally starting with sex workers would get me to where I'm at and also meet the people that I get to meet and interact with. I didn't think food or this would bring me to um, just this plethora yeah. of people and connections and networking and the positive overall, not 100,000 percent positivity feedback that I've gotten from it is is beyond me. I mean, internationally, people will drop a message or a DM yes. and just thank me for what I do. And uh, that I can't even imagine that. I never, ever imagined any of this, any of this. Such it's an so- incredibly inspiring story. Really. It is. It is. It is. It's my <laughs> last story. You know what I mean? I like to say I, um, I tapped into my potential at the age of 37, finally. I was one of those people that I always, uh, whether I was getting like right when I'm about to get fired or something, some shit at school, they're just like, oh, you have so much potential and this, that, this, you know, all this shit. And so it, it feels good to finally to be able to tap into that so-called potential I never uh, had this before. So, no, so good. Like, I am just yeah. amazed at this. I really hope all the listeners are appreciating this story. Again, it's truly inspiring very very motivating and i cannot wait to see what you have next in store for the world so <laughs> me too me too i'm sorry too <laughs> <laughs> i guess with that we'll go into some q a's because we got a couple questions here that came in from some listeners or curious listeners and your fans so okay. uh first question is how can white folks support this work how can white folks support this work Hmm. Sex work, my business. Um, I yeah, mean, it didn't specify. So uh, up to you how you want okay. to interpret. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, I have a GoFundMe. Uh, <laughs> you know, what I, mean? I also have a Venmo and a Cash App. It's all meals. <laughs> the number four heels, H E E L S. Okay. Um, I mean, just I mean, tagging, posting online. Yep. Um, just you know, clicking, reading articles, or listening to podcasts that I've. I've done listening to this podcast, being respectful and tipping and paying your sex workers in your local area, looking towards black and BIPOC sex workers, maybe first instead of, you know, white, white sex workers. Yeah. Uh, Because it is a lot harder for uh, black and BIPOC sex workers out there. Yeah, just, yeah, I'd say respectful sex workers, tip them well. Yes. Um, No (laughs) back talk. All that stuff. And it's like you, you know I mean it's it's a reciprocal thing. Like yes. if you want to have a good time and you want to make the, you know, it's you know, it's just a give and take it's give and take. If you're nice and I'm you know, nice, we do this, I'm doing my job, this, we can do this again. <laughs> we can do this again. That's how simple it is. There you go. Yeah, it is. Like, we can do this again. It really is yeah. simple. Like it doesn't have to be a huge equa- equation or anything. It's just like, okay, you know, you give and you get what you receive, right? So mm-hmm. simple yeah, as enjoy that. Enjoy the experience. Enjoy the experience. <laughs> be good to you. Be kind to strip strip boys and sex workers and tip them tip them well. Tip them accordingly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what kind of challenges have you had to overcome? Again, they didn't give any context, so you're free to answer that however you want to. Um, some challenges. I would say like I said, I I thought in the beginning I guess I thought I was going to maybe talk to club owners a little bit more. And with that, I thought having the blonde, you know, very, you know, I'd say attractive, very attractive, uh, younger (laughs) dancer girlfriend, uh, I thought we'd need her to get, get my foot in the door. You know what I mean? But I didn't go that route once I found out that a lot of club owners aren't the nicest people and to their employees as well. Oh my gosh. And you can, you know, you see the patriarchy there, obviously. So um, I say that was that was a challenge, just trying to get my foot in the door and and being comfortable with me, a black gay looking ass female coming in there. You know what I mean? Trying to <laughs> I don't know fuck up their shit. Well, not even fuck up their shit, but just you know just doing something that different. Yeah. And also, I felt like for a lot of time, I felt like I had a target on my back, and I still do. Really? You know what I mean? Um. I, yeah. Just uh, I mean, there's no one else. I believe doing what the Fancy. fuck I do. Yeah. I know there's people that have, and I know there's people, uh, I, I mean, I've been contacting people who did something similar, A, B, and C, but there's someone here in Portland who's doing something similar, but whatever, it didn't, it didn't work out. But, um, uh, yeah. And just maybe club owners don't want me, you know, they might not want anything there. They might not want extra food or they might not want this, that, and the other. So, right. or maybe they're jealous. They didn't come up with that idea. And I don't think personally, I, it might sound whatever the fuck, I don't think it would work if it was a male. Yeah, I guess no, I don't think always, so. You know, even if you're nicest kind of, there's still, you know, there's going to be that creep factor. It's a, I, I just like, you know, there's some safety and security in that. So, For sure. Um, I think it was just, uh, just taking that step from being an employee to employer. That was the scariest, hardest, hardest part. Okay. And um, 
it sounds almost uh, like a Hollywood movie, but I was going to go into work. Um, I was about 40 minutes out from going to work, and yeah. I was getting out of the shower, and I wiped off the, sh- the, win- the mirror, and I didn't want to go to work. I just looked at myself, I don't want to go to work. And so I <laughs> called out sick, ended up getting fired, and then that oh week God. I started, I actually went out and started Mills for Heroes that Friday. Wow. Um, and it all worked out, especially the firing, because here, here in Lisa, Oregon, if you get fired from your job, and it's not for some stupid shit you did, you can get unemployment. So oh. that helped me, you know, ease into it, have a little, little, little income come in while I'm trying to build the business. Oh, interesting. Mm-hmm. Oh, and again, it's like you're, you're at the end of your rope there and then a door opens. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I was, I was definitely felt like I was at the end of my rope in the uh, kitchen, kitchens mm-hmm. here in Portland. Yeah. I worked at several different places. I, like I said, either fired, quit, whatever, or it yeah. just didn't work out. And one of the last spots I worked at, I actually enjoyed being there. I was there for almost a year. Yeah. I got fired for some bullshit reasons, wow. but then was asked to come back three weeks later. Oh. And um, I didn't. And I don't know, just shit just worked out. And ever since then, doors, opportunities, everything is just, uh, it just, it just opened. I, I don't even know. So <laughs> I just try to give, give whatever I put in, I try to definitely give back. For sure. And like, again, start from the bottom, now you're here. So. <laughs> Right? Look at you. (laughs) You too can, uh, you know, have a bomb-ass business with being a college dropout and two-time (laughs) failing. I love it. (laughs) Yeah. Um, What is your background? What is my background? Yeah. Hmm. Uh, (laughs) um, I'm I'm black, African-American. I'm a lesbian. I'm 39 um i'm 510 <laughs> i'm kind of thick right now COVID thick 250 oh, 60 yeah. something um <laughs> my background um uh, yeah i lived born in california um lived in portugal japan arizona north dakota Amazing. california <laughs> portland north yeah so north carolina yeah that's about that's about it um yeah uh i came from a loving family at home i'm very grateful to have a mom and dad that supported me and yeah. uh, had I was able to travel around the world and try different foods and cultures and customs and yes. bring that back here to Portland. Um, I I have a soft spot for you know grief. I lost my dad a couple years ago and mm. that was the hardest thing ever and still is. And he is my biggest cheerleader. And um, I I know I'm not spiritual but um, or I'm not um, religious but. I definitely feel him and other people that I've lost in my life are definitely, uh, you know, looking out for me. And yeah. um, I'm incredibly grateful. I, I talk to them and I say my words to them and I, and I thank them. I don't ask them for much, but uh, they, <laughs> they show up. So, um, yeah, and that, that that's like this extra cape or extra, you know, something superpower that I have. I like that. And <laughs> great answer to that question, too. It's like, how are you going to answer it? It's so vague. <laughs> <laughs> Great answer. I love it. I'm a lot of things. My brain has a lot of things. Yeah. You all packed that in like a one minute answer. It's perfect. Thank you. Thank you. And we got the last question here. I don't want to take your whole Friday night. So, um, what were your mo- what were your motivators to start me- meal for? Ugh. What were the motivators to start meals for heels? The motivators. Uh, the motivators were. Oops, hold on. Uh, I dropped you. Um, the <laughs> motivators were not wanting to work for someone else anymore. Yeah. The motivators were, once again, 75 plus strip clubs, mm-hmm. uh, three to 12 dancers per club. Um, do the math on do that. The math, yeah. The motivators are there's no one doing this. This is a, a, a group, a niche of people who have income, disposable income. They tip really fucking well they under, like i said they understand the, the value of their time in a dollar yeah and um it's it's just uh just everything with sex work like i said predominantly female business uh the misogyny the bullshit pizza oh shit you know fuck fuck all that i, I just <laughs> that that ends that stops they're, they're, it's an interesting group sex workers um i feel like that's a very strong i'm not in that clique but mm-hmm. i see the bonds i see the uh you know when they stand up for each other yeah. and whatnot and it's ridiculous like i said it's just ridiculous so much shit they go through whether they're at a club or whether they do out call or in call service or full service etc yeah um and who who's on top you know whether it's white females and this that uh, shit, right. who owns the clubs and etc and why are you you know shitting on you know women or dancers when you're the motherfucker in there you know yeah I mean? yeah <laughs> like, no i hear you yeah. <laughs> so um yeah it's it's all that i like to say empowering women empowering 
um, or just like I said, bringing a positive or a positive light to sex work, or just yeah, getting a little more mainstream, not just the Hollywood yeah. movie or this, that, and this. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, sex work has always been real work. You know what I mean? They're the best tippers. It's damn sure for me the best clientele. Um, yes. I mean, like I like to say, who the fuck goes into a club, a strip club, and the strippers give them money? Not many people. No. Not many no. people. <laughs> Every time, and every time, I'm so I'm I, I'm naturally high off it. Every time I make a delivery and go to a club, because it's it's the best shit ever. It's the best way to spend my my, my nights. You know what I mean? So perfect. Ah, oh, yeah. so so good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, the food does so much. You know, not only is it delicious, and healthy, but it's like I you know I put a little piece of me in every meal, and um the the like I said the response back. I I know they uh taste it too as well yes. and they, they see that and they enjoy it and um it's it's a lot more than just a meal you know what I'm saying? it is yeah because food it brings is. people together absolutely it brings communities together, together. It, it like unifies communities it's everything and it makes you feel good absolutely so. <laughs> yeah. yes it does but before i let you go let you where go. can we find you you can find me on facebook instagram at meals the number four heels h e e l s also www.meals the number four heels.com um you can google search to go fund me you know it's not really active but that's that's fine i'm not worried about that i have information on my website and I have information on my instagram and facebook i'm way active more active on instagram the gram is more my my spot yes. i do have a tiktok but i haven't posted a video yet and, <laughs> you know you can find me here in portland oregon if you want come through there you go. So any American listeners, please support <laughs> Meals for Heels. Excellent. I'm going to put all these links in the show notes below if you guys haven't, if you guys haven't checked it out already. So I'll be there. And that's it for this week. It's Strip by Sia on Instagram. Sia Steph is my personal. Get at me. New episodes every Sunday. Nikisa, thank you so much, so, so much for joining me on the show today. Thank you for having me, your energy. I can feel your energy from over here, and it feels great. I had a great time with this. Yes. Until next time, guys. See you guys next Sunday. Ciao. You're listening to Strip by Sia, hosted, produced, and edited by Steph Sia, artwork by Maria Bellinzarama, music by Ted D., and photography by Ian Dabern.